I'm here with Lois Brown. She is Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development and an MP from Newmarket Aurora, just outside of Toronto. Mrs. Brown, welcome. Thank you very much, Cheryl, for having me here. It's so great to have you here. And you know, one of the roles and one of the most important roles that you do is that you're a member of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International mm -hmm. Development. Tell me a little bit about what that role entails because you're making really important decisions that are affecting not just Canada, but many countries around the world. Well, we are, Cheryl, and uh, I consider it an incredible privilege to be part of that, part of that committee and part of that team. It is, it's been a team that's been able to look at some of the critical issues that we are facing as a nation and that the world is facing and to bring forward recommendations on how Canada should respond. So you were talking to me earlier about the integration of the Foreign Affairs Department with the international development projects that we've done. And that has been a remarkable integration for our government. But the reality is that we now have development and foreign affairs talking from the same policy page. And it means that the things that we're trying to accomplish in our development dollars are the same discussions that are taking place with our foreign affairs uh, staff who are working overseas. We've had a history here at Crossroads of having a great partnership with the Canadian government over the years, working in humanitarian and development projects, and we've been so grateful. And I know it means a lot to our viewers as well, because many times when we have those partnerships, it means when they donate to a cause, they can double or even triple Absolutely. their donation with the government's help. Absolutely. You know, and I know those kinds of partnerships have slowed down a bit as this merger's been happening and it's been working out. And I see now things are starting to move. What, what can charities like ours look for moving ahead? What is the goal of this new you know, kind of amalgamated organization? Well, in our call for proposals, we are always looking for proposals that are going to work forward with our, with our development objectives. We uh, continue to work on food security, something that I know is dear to your heart, strengthening health systems. I mean, all of those things are going to be the objectives that we are working towards in all of our initiatives. And why is it important for the government to partner with NGOs and, and charities? Why, you know, are, are we needed? And do we play an important role in this? Oh, absolutely. The Canadian government does not actually have people who go out and provide on, on staff with the government who do the health care work or who do the education. We have all kinds of partnerships with NGOs across Canada, multilateral partnerships, you are absolutely fundamental to us accomplishing those objectives. So from my heart, I, I always like to say thank you to the people who are in the development world because I believe they're people with golden hearts who truly have a passion to go to where many other Canadians would never go, but they want to go and they want to commit their lives to helping other people. First of all, raise them out of poverty in, in many situations, raise them out of poverty, like give them an opportunity, give opportunities for education, because that's what's really going to grow many of these developing economies. They're my heroes as well. I think people don't realize the, the sacrifice, the level of sacrifice and passion and, and service that people give. I meet them all the time and I'm so humbled by their work. Well, I think one thing many Canadians are proud of is the leadership that the government has taken in um, maternal, newborn, and child health, and, and really wanting to take a global leadership role. And we love that. As Crossroads Relief and Development, we work in maternal health. You know, we, we have a good friend, both of us, and Dr. Jean Chamberlain with Save the Mothers. Tell me a little bit about what you've been doing across Canada, because this is really what you've been focused on in the, in the last few months. Cheryl, could I just put this in a little bit of context? that in 2010 when Canada hosted the G8 meetings, it was our opportunity as the host country to choose an initiative on which we would like to see some, some progress. And our Prime Minister, recognizing that the Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5 had really not received the kind of attention that they needed and that we were not going to meet the 2015 objectives, made the determination that maternal, newborn and child health was going to be Canada's flagship development project. And at those meetings, Canada committed $2.85 billion to make sure that we were addressing those goals. We were able to leverage that money with the contributions of other G8 and non-G8 countries, 
as well as foundations and private sector, into some $7.3 billion. And so we have seen incredible progress. In the last five years, we have seen the mortality in childbirth drop by about 50%. We have saved the lives of 1.3 million children. And so we know that we're making a difference. We're not done. There's still more to do. I was in East Africa in April and looking at this very issue and I was so surprised at how simple some of the solutions were and some of the things that women were dying from. I think a lot of people assume um, that maternal mortality is happening because of something very complicated, you know, some surgeries or equipment that we have here. And it really is not, you know, one of the countries I was in has a similar population to Canada. Mm -hmm. And we lose about 50 mothers a year here maximum, and that's, that's terrible. But they lose 6,000. That's right. And it's from things, I'm talking to doctors who are telling me they're in the middle of doing a cesarean section. The power goes out, it's nighttime. They have a generator, but they have no gas for the generator. They have no money to buy the gas for the generator. So they're pulling out their cell phone and they're finishing this complicated surgery by the light of their cell phone. Why, why do we as a world let women die from things that are so simple to fix? Well, and that's the great question. Exactly the question that our Prime Minister put on the floor and said, we have to stop this. They are simple solutions in many, many cases. And you know, Cheryl, one of the things that I've heard over and over in these consultations is the whole, the whole initiative on education. Because so many of the rural communities, there's no one there who can diagnose a difficult pregnancy or look and see whether or not it's going to be an obstructed birth. I love to tell the story of being in Mali last September. I was asked to attend the inauguration of the new president and I was on the ground for about 48 hours. I arrived on Tuesday night at midnight. I left on the Thursday night at 10 o'clock. Thursday all day was taken up with the inaugural uh, events but I took the day before to visit some of our projects. And I visited a hospital in Banico where Canada has invested in equipment and expertise. I held in my hands a baby who was four hours old. She wasn't yet even named. She weighed four pounds. Hmm. But the reason that that baby has a thriving chance in life is because the equipment was there that would give her the ability as a preemie to be taken care of and the expertise from Canadian doctors who were monitoring her every minute. Just as importantly, the mum who was just barely 16 years of age was being given all the antenatal care that she was going to, the postnatal care that she was going to need and she was going to be monitored through all of her recovery. This baby was going to be given all of the vaccinations and inoculations that she would need to combat disease and be given supplements that would give her the nutritional start in life that would allow her to thrive. And I think those are the kinds of stories that Canadians don't hear. Mm -hmm. And we need to hear. Well, I know that the decisions that you're involved in making impact so many people's lives. And, you know, the Bible talks about that we need to pray for our leaders in Canada. So I want to make sure that we ask people who are watching today to remember to pray for Lois Brown and all of the people in the Foreign Affairs and the Development Committee uh, at Parliament Hill that are making these decisions that are affecting so many people's lives. Thank you for all that you're doing and thank you for coming to see us today. Thank you, Cheryl.